Solutions, signature colors, copyright, and reserving rights with UCC Section 3-402B1 versus Section 1-308. Our signature is one of the most important artistic works we make on a regular basis. With the current state of lawfare, practical knowledge about our signature is more important than ever. Our signature is our consent, authentication, and agreement to contracts, terms and services, policies, presumptions, and can even compel performances by lethal force. This video goes over the natural meaning of various colors of signatures, why copywriting our signature is so important, and how to reserve rights with a signature using Uniform Commercial Code Section 3-402B1 Signature by Representative versus UCC Section 1-308 Reservation of Rights. This is not legal advice and is provided only for educational purposes. Only fictitious lawyers calling themselves licensed attorneys are permitted to attorn and provide such legal, fictional, voluntary, insubstantial, and dehumanizing advice. Part 1. Signature Colors The color of a signature has striking natural meaning with colors like gold, green, purple, red, blue, and black. A black ink signature means that the signer is dead, civil liter mortis. Civiliter mortus. Civilly dead, lost at the sea of commerce. Dead people's names typically use all uppercase lettering as seen in cemeteries and on death certificates. Uppercase names are described by Capitus Diminutio Maxima Capitus Diminutio Maxima as the maximal reduction of human status to that of a slave without citizenship and without freedom. In cartoons, we see the X in the eyes to signify a character as dead. If there is an X to specify where to put a signature, that is also a marking of the dead. Cross out the X or make a circle around the X touching each endpoint, and then write by with a colon after to humanize the signature prefix. A black signature on a copy of a document or on a replication can make it a true copy. A blue ink signature means acting in commerce and at sea, in a form of admiralty, statutory, and commercial law. This is the signature color of a legal presence artificial person, because the legal presence is an incorporation in commerce. The other meaning of blue ink is of a proper authorized representative for the legal presence artificial person if signed correctly, but more on this shortly. I prefer blue ink for commercial matters with the copyright and reference to being the authorized representative for the legal presence. A red ink signature means flesh and blood, a living, breathing man or woman. There is no relation to the legal presence except as the authorized representative and such relation must be made explicit in writing. A purple ink signature means royal and acting both in the commercial fiction at sea and as a living man or woman on the land. This color bridges the gap between the living and the commercial. There isn't much to sign that requires such co-mingling. In most instances, I like to minimize and limit the domain of my signature color to only what is needed. A green ink signature means peacetime, law of peace, non-commercial, and eating from and living on the green land. When dealing with any legal or governmental matter, I prefer green because legal fictions called governments operate under law of war. This is documented by the golden yellow fringe ornamentation on their flags, found in Army Regulation 840-10, Flags Guidance, Streamers, Tabards, and Automobile and Aircraft Plates, Section 2-3, B and C. As we can see here, the golden yellow fringe on flags in every so-called U.S. and state court in America denotes that they are actually operating as military courtroom tribunals under law of war and as a franchise of the United Nations rather than being law of peace constitutional courts. Courts are not the same as courtrooms, and by law of war, we are owed law of peace. Green ink denotes such peacetime jurisdiction. A gold ink signature means sovereign and from the godhead. It is most applicable to financial and legal instrument originals. Their copies will not have such golden ink and may even have to be signed separately in black ink as true copies. Use gold ink, for example, with sparkles as a security feature, a financial security feature just like microprint. Comment below on your interpretation of these or other colors, or color changing or glow in the dark inks, or maybe some other ink oddity. Do you have something special for your personal financial security features? My favorite security feature is a part two copyright. Regardless of color, our signature is our primary authenticating artistic work and needs to be copyrighted just like paintings. Remember, our signature is artwork.
A copyright on our signature also makes the document being signed into a copyrighted artistic work and reserves the right to authorize and authenticate its copies. With the copyright, copies of your signature and the document may not be made or used without your explicit permission. This is instant karma for anyone that does not respect the copyright on my signature. The United Nations member states' judicial systems are the worst offenders of signature pirating. Color of law, magistrates and judges reuse our signature internally or sign for us on the back end, like to sign off on things like warrants, bails and other bonds, checks and legal instruments without our knowledge or informed consent. If these military courtrooms posing as our local courts operated on the rule of law, the copyright would prevent many forms of judicial and banking fraud presently taking place, seemingly mandated by the United Nations of their member states' judicial and banking systems. If you do not want other people ganking your signature artistic work, it is important to copyright it every time. Get in the habit of putting a copyright after your signature. Part 3, UCC Section 1-308, Without Prejudice, Under Duress. It's a trap. The U.S. Social Security Administration doesn't allow any alterations to a signature on their Form SS-5 application for a Social Security card. They are subtly referring to marking it with UCC Section 1-308 terms like without prejudice, under protest, under duress, or all rights reserved. These 1-308 alterations would prevent the fraud that the Social Security Administration and other companies require to work their legal fictitious debt instrument magic. This is why they reject all paperwork that properly has such alterations. Thus we see the effectiveness of using terms like without prejudice and all rights reserved by the fact that the Social Security Administration explicitly rejects their use. However, the UN military courtrooms posing as our local courts relate to UCC Section 1-308 in a different way because they do seem to be ignoring exercise of this code with complete impunity. Here's what it is and why. Uniform Commercial Code Section 1-308 is titled The Performance or Acceptance Under Reservation of Rights, and it provides Part A. A party that with explicit reservation of rights performs or promises performance or assents to performance in a manner demanded or offered by the other party does not thereby prejudice the rights reserved. Such words as without prejudice or under protest or the like are sufficient. Using without prejudice, under duress, all rights reserved, and the like has five problems. First, by using UCC Section 1-308, we are acknowledging and consenting to the commercial jurisdiction and being party to performance of a contract with a specific manner demanded and offered. Second, by using it, we are acknowledging that we are the legal presence artificial person being presumed rather than being identified as a living man or woman. Third, the legal presence fictitious person doesn't have any actual rights to reserve. It only has revocable privileges, and those, in legalese, can be referred to as rights, but they are not actual, proper, God-given, reservable rights. Fourth, confusing the legal presence artificial person as if it were you is legally incompetent, making any so-called rights impossible to reserve using UCC Section 1-308 alone. And lastly, subsection B of UCC section 1-308 provides that, quote, subsection A does not apply to an accord and satisfaction, end quote. Especially when the accord, otherwise known as an agreement, and its satisfaction or its performance is for you to be the accommodation surety for and as a legal fictional artificial person that doesn't have any reservable rights, but again, only has revocable privileges. That said, UCC section 1-308 is a trap by itself. If it works, it is selective and unlawfully unreliable and intermittent. However, if and when used, it should be used in the context of Part 4, UCC section 3-402b1, Signature by Authorized Representative. This is a very powerful code to use with our signature. This code changes our relationship to agreements being made to that of an attorney in fact, where the default relation is not what we want, especially to reserve our rights. UCC Section 3-402b1 disavows that you, the living man or woman, are liable and party to the agreement or contract, even when the legal presence or artificial person is still presumed to be liable and party. Pretty powerful, eh? 
By the way, this is a global solution because uniform commercial code is universally adopted by all UN member states, just like international copyright. First, some background. Have you ever noticed any microprinting below the signature location on checks or money orders? It looks like a line, but zooming in, it says authorized signature over and over in extremely fine microprint constituting the line itself. The meaning is found in UCC section 3-402 subsection A providing, if the represented person is bound, the signature of the representative is the quote, authorized signature of the represented person, end quote, and the represented person is liable on the instrument whether or not identified in the instrument. This implies that we, as representative, sign in place of and for the legal presence artificial person being made liable and compelled to perform without rights. Under subsection B2, the code intends the authorized representative to also be liable on the instrument by default. When the represented person is not identified in the contract or instrument, or when the signature does not show unambiguously that the signature is made in a representative capacity, the representative is liable. This is the opposite of subsection B1 that provides the signature must show unambiguously that it is made in a representative capacity of the represented person identified, and then the representative is not liable on the instrument. Again, the representative is not liable on the instrument or agreement or its performance when specified, and the representative can be a living man or woman, particularly with non-legal identity papers. This divorces the living man or woman from the legal presence artificial person by making ourselves the authorized representative acting on behalf of the legal presence artificial person rather than appearing or manifesting as the legal presence artificial person. A statutory general durable power of attorney will do the same thing in paperwork. The consequences of signing with liability are documented in UCC section 3-419. As you can see, it is a bit of a word salad, so I'll summarize. In subsection A, an accommodation party is an authorized representative who signs the instrument for the purpose of incurring liability on the instrument without being a direct beneficiary of the value given for the instrument. And in subsection C, as an accommodation party, the signer is acting as surety or guarantor with respect to the obligation of another party to the instrument. Without UCC section 3-402b1 limiting liability, the fictional obligations of the legal presence artificial person become our real physical obligations upon us as living men and women. This is not the only legal device of entrapment and enslavement, but those are for another video. Subscribe and like. As such, we want our signature to be as a representative, but that is not called an autograph. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, page 83, the term allograph means an agent's writing or signature for the principal. This is the antonym of autograph. The agent is the authorized representative and the principal is the represented person as a legal presence artificial person. An allograph is the opposite of an autograph. An autograph being a person's own writing or signature, a person being the legal presence artificial person, of course. There are people who say that a signature is different than an autograph, and that a signature compels us into their legal system, but an autograph does not. However, given these legal definitions, an autograph is legally defined as a signature and vice versa. An autograph is one of two kinds of signatures, the other being an allograph. This is seen in the legal definition of signature being 1. A person's name or mark written by that person or at the person's direction, and 2. Commercial law, any name, mark, or writing used with the intention of authenticating a document. Due to using uniform commercial code, definition 2 seems more applicable, but definition 1 is also applied as well in being the authorized representative at the direction of the represented principal legal presence person within commercial law UCC. What is interesting to note is that all autographs do compel legal presence by legal definition, but allographs do not compel legal presence artificial personage upon the attorney in fact. 
An allograph, in meeting the requirements of UCC Section 3-402b1, provides that the authorized representative signer is not party nor liable to the instrument being signed, despite the represented fictitious legal presence person continuing to be party and liable. The alteration to make our signature into perfected allographs is by writing above, after, or under the signature or line the words agent or authorized representative or attorney in fact. Any one of these three will work as they are interchangeable. If the represented person's name is not on the contract, document, or instrument, then append the word for and then add the name of the represented legal presence artificial person in all uppercase in most instances. So for instance, quote, authorized representative for John Doe, end quote, or quote, attorney in fact for Jane Doe, end quote. Our signature must comply with UCC section 3-402b1 for us to be considered legally competent and not liable. Other components of legal competency include a recorded statutory general durable power of attorney over their legal presence artificial person for us, knowing the phrase, quote, take constructive notice that I am competent to handle my affairs and over the age of 21, end quote, and making a, quote, special appearance, end quote, using that phrase in court to challenge jurisdiction when asked for a name. One problem is that the exercise of proper legal knowledge, such as not identifying as a legal fictitious person, is unlawfully considered to be the legal fictitious person's mental disease by courtrooms, judges, and attorneys. But that is for another video. Like, subscribe, and click that notification bell for more. Part 5. Conclusion There are many different colors we can use for our signature, and the best color is going to be situational. I like green, blue, and gold. But regardless of color, always put a copyright on that signature, and where necessary, alter the signature under UCC section 3-402b1 by adding the words authorized representative for and the name of the legal presence represented person to limit liability. In the context of being the authorized representative, we should be using without prejudice or all rights reserved under UCC section 1-308 to show our lack of consent and reservation of rights, but also because its negative aspects are mitigated. Social Security Administration will reject any application that has without prejudice or all rights reserved written on it and possibly a copyright. But they are required by their own law to accept signatures from authorized representatives that are unambiguously marked as such. I even caught the Social Security Administration practicing law in rejecting my status as authorized representative until I read them the Pennsylvania statute requiring their compliance. See episode 2 in the card above. If you think UCC section 1-308 is important, then you should study UCC section 3-402, specifically subsection B1, and have a statutory general durable power of attorney. The primary problem we have is that the very attorneys who enact the law are the people who refuse to honor these laws when it suits them. When it mattered, not one attorney, not one judge, not one sheriff would recognize my proper personal exercise of UCC section 3-402b1 or 1-308, not even the defense attorneys. This shows that even when signing properly according to the law, it requires legal enforcement to act according to their own statutes, and they knowingly, willfully, intentionally, and maliciously do not. In circumstance after circumstance, legal enforcers in UN member states refuse to honor our exercise of rights and the law and violate and refuse to stop violating their own laws. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, yet is the government's excuse in continuing their lawlessness time and time again. The reason why the legal system in America seems to be lacking in justice is because not a single attorney is acting to honor our natural rights, but they are each engaged in a silent conspiracy to misrepresent us as legal presence non-human persons in military courtrooms. So be warned, following the law isn't enough to prevent the government from being and acting lawlessly, especially color of law police, sheriffs, attorneys, magistrates, judges, child protective services, community mental health services, and the like. Still, it is important to practice proper form even when the governments and attorneys are as lawless as they have been. Overstanding what they are doing helps us defend ourselves from their weaponization of law. Violations of UCC Section 3-402b1 by attorneys and even judges can and should be reported to the attorney's state and federal bar. 
In my personal experience, state and federal bar attorney grievance committees seem to be fellow legal cartel members covering up unlawful and criminal misrepresentation of living men and women as legal fictional artificial persons of their fellow co-conspirator attorneys at large. However, letting attorneys know that we are on to their legal person identity scam is an important message for us to voice, even if government and attorney grievance committees only give passes and pardon upon obvious misrepresentations and fraud. Here is a tip specifically for world citizens regarding our signatures. Include your world citizen identity P number after your signature for reference, just like attorneys do. And lastly, an amusing rat fact. An autograph refers to the term holograph in Black's Law Dictionary. A holograph is considered a document that is handwritten by its author. The only thing considered real in a legal fiction is what is written on paper. Legal fiction is created as a documented paper trail. Yet, real handwritten documents are considered no more real than a synthetic imitation false light hologram. The legal system is a constructed system of pure fiction without substance, and yet it frames actual reality as the fabricated holograph. Talk about projection. Thank you for your attention and focus. Here are some other videos that may interest you. Click to continue the transmission. Like, subscribe, notify, and share.